to deliver this, our fifth seminar on the Critical Reflections on Youth Community and Urban Regeneration Seminar Series. And our seminar series is very kindly sponsored by the Department of Sociology in UL, the Irish Social Science Platform, and the Faculty of Arts, Humanities, and Social Science here at UL. So our speaker today, uh, Dr. Patricia Neville, today she's going to talk about how historically Irish society has had a very long tradition of grassroots voluntary community work However, with the rise of neoliberalism throughout the 1990s, the Irish community development sector has become increasingly subjected to government controls and restrictions. So as a result of this, voluntary community work has become much more formally organized, much more centrally regulated, and very much depoliticized. So she's going to outline for us the current state of research about volunteers in Ireland and community development in Ireland. So Patricia works within a qualitative research paradigm, so the seminar is going to introduce a case study of one family Center and its voluntary management committee in order to explore how the volunteers experience this type of volunteering work or voluntary work through an analysis of their reflections on their role, their responsibilities, and its overall impa impact on their everyday lives and their political awareness. So we're delighted to welcome Patricia. So I'll hand over to her. Thanks for that, Gina. Thanks for those um, lovely word words of welcome, and it's always very nice to come back and um, uh, especially to be part of such a um, a very, very interesting and innovative um, series of seminars that have been that are being offered to yourself here as student MA students of the um, Youth Community and Social Regeneration. So thank you again for the invitation. Thank you very much for coming here. Yeah. Um, I suppose before I just get going, um, I suppose the um, the genesis for this presentation actually came and started about two years ago when um, I conducted some research on family resource centres in Ireland and. Um, the reason I did that was because a good co colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Colm O'Doherty, down at the Institute of Technology down in Killy, and myself and another colleague, Ashley Jackson, were um, putting together a book proposal for what was at that time when they were putting together the proposal was going to be one of the first for textbooks to be offered to both undergrad and postgrad students of community development work in Ireland. That was going to be specifically about Ireland, and we're going to talk about specific case studies. So this research, I suppose I started looking into this topic about community development and um, volunteerism in the community development context in Ireland um, back then. So what we're going to talk, what you're going to hear today is some bits of that original research which I did, which I conducted um, as part of, um, that will, of that book, which will be coming out actually shortly. I think it's going to be April or May. It's going to be launched by Gail Macmillan. Um, so I'm not going to just trot out what you'll find in that book. Um, I'm going to obviously reference it as we move through, especially towards the latter half of the talk. I'm going to reference just some of the findings that came out of that research piece of research that I did. But um, generally, I'm going to, I suppose what we're going to talk about today more is a much more sort of theoretical engagement with, and also, I suppose, deeper policy investigation of the impact that new neo uh, liberalism is having on community development sector in Ireland in general, and also volunteering and volunteerism as a result. Um, I hope to keep you to maybe about 35, 40 minutes. Um, if I go over that time, I, I, I trust Car uh, Kino will give me the nod and, uh, and I'll wrap up then um, without you know, leaving hopefully enough time for people to um, uh, mm -hmm. ask questions. And first of all, before I start talking about I suppose, the topic at hand, can I just ask people, how many people here maybe have volunteered um, in a community at a development program or project or family resource centre? Okay, great. So we're going to have a, a lot of people here who have a lot of um, personal experience of working in the sector and also working as a volunteer. So hopefully it, that will lead to very interesting uh, maybe questions and answer questions after the, after the seminar. But to get to that point, I have to get going on the seminar. So here, um, without further ado, um, here we go, I'm going to uh, talk about it. So, um, title is Community Development and Organised Volunteerism in Ireland. Um, as an activity um, in which time is given freely to benefit another person, group or organisation, volunteering has historically been conceptualised as an activity that both conveys as well as produces social value. And the link between volunteering and active citizenship is well established in the practical writings of the Durkheim and de Tocqueville, with each respectively postulating that volunteering regulates uh, hedonistic individualism and ensures a healthy citizenship. And those ideas, as you know, um, as they were popular back in, in the 19th century, there's still, uh, still a viewpoint that's prevalent today. 
However, we should also remember that volunteering is not just an abstract concept for a theoretical musing and conjecture. Social, historical, political, legislative, policy and discursive factors also influence how voluntary activity is socially constructed and experienced. And it's the nature and the extent of the interactions uh, between each of these forces in contemporary Irish sea, which is what we'll be discussing today. Um, perhaps one of the most potent ideological forces in public and government discourse of late has been that of neoliberalism. And I'm sure as students of, uh, uh, of Martin, and I know Tina, you probably are well versed in neoliberalism and what it's all about, but just for those who, uh, just to, I suppose, make sure that everybody's on the same um, hymn sheet uh, for today, um, neoliberalism refers to a political ideology that champions discourses of, um, of individualism, consumerism, and market um, competitiveness. And the neoliberal political landscape is dominated also by an emphasis on individual responsibility, a critique of the welfare state, and a shift towards privatization, and an emphasis on the private sector. Um, and these, all, these concerns all contribute to a focus on the localization of responsibility for welfare. And it is in this discursive field or discursive formation that the role that the nonprofit or voluntary sector and also that of the individual um, volunteer takes in precedence. And it's being proposed as an ideological site where social and political malaise um, can be corrected. So while many commentators have discussed the effect that neoliberal ideology has had on the Irish education system, for instance, Irish economic policies, and also Irish healthcare system, and the impact that neoliberalism has had on the Irish community development sector, and also on, on, on volunteering in general, uh, remains to be as extensively probed and as critically analyzed um, as these previous um, sectors, the education, health, and, and um, systems. Um, so to this end, this seminar will explore the impact that neoliberal policies and ideologies have had on the Irish community development sector um, and its volunteers. So while volunteerism and community development will be discussed separately to begin with, um, in reality the two sectors are rather closely intertwined. And this interconnection will be made more explicit, I hope, when we discuss the case of Family Resource Centre programme in Ireland. There we find a programme funded by the state to tackle disadvantage and poverty and support families in the local community, but which relies heavily on volunteer resources, not only to man the services they offer, but also to lead and manage these centres. And such a situation creates many paradoxes in the Irish community development, um, both generally and specifically. Um, at a sector level, we encounter the depoliticization of community development and the increased bureaucratization of the sector. And then more specifically, we find that the neoliberalization of community development has created two categories of volunteers. You have the ordinary project volunteer and the voluntary management, or what they call the voluntary director position. Um, and it's this latter category of volunteer that um, will come in for close inspectivation, inspection, I should say, towards the latter half of this um, presentation. A high level of operation expectation and competency is demanded by this particular volunteer position and such a recategorizing of community development volunteers, one that is now based on a hierarchy of roles and responsibility, it openly challenges the passive consumerist model of volunteering that's often espoused by neoliberalism. So, and so in order to further explore this contradiction, basically I'll introduce at the very end um, a case study of the experiences of the Voluntary Management Committee of just one family resource centre. Um, and we're going to present that and we're going to talk about that to the bigger context. So, in terms of then neoliberalism and volunteerism, just I suppose in Ireland in general, um, it has already been mentioned that the concept of volunteerism and the role that volunteer plays play, plays an integral part in the ideology of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism apportions personal, social, and economic value to <coughs> voluntary activism. The neoliberal discourse of volunteering is also promotes. Um, an ideology of essentialism around volunteering, um, where volunteering is taken as being naturally occurring in most functional societies. And it's this wellspring of volunteerism is assumed to be motivated by idealistic and ultimately personal motives. So tapping into the long-standing tradition of conceptualizing volunteers as emblems of caring and goodness, neoliberalism takes this notion to propose that volunteers are energetic, committed, civic-minded individuals who, by their actions, 
make their community a better place to live in. Little discussion um, is given over to explaining why people volunteer in neoliberal states other than as a response to their having time on their hands. Um, and this notion that volunteering is a consequence of free time is a dominant trope in neoliberal research about the benefits of volunteering. For instance, um, it is widely reported that in 1998, the American public volunteered 20.3 billion hours of their time to local voluntary projects. In um, Australia, the number of hours given by volunteers was found to equate um, the work of 50,000 paid employees. And even then, more locally in Ireland in 2010, in a press release from um, the department, or from the state, um, 20, the 22 government-funded volunteer centres in Ireland um, were argued to provide nearly 400,000 hours of community <coughs> service to their local community. So by quantifying volunteering in such a temporal way, volunteering is redefined as an individuated leisure activity rather than a politically motivated and purposeful action. As Hyatt um, has remarked, the appeal of the volunteer lies in his or her image as an empowered and self-governing person who appears to operate independently of formal state structures. Creating social capital <coughs> that does not carry with it a price tag that presumes the largesse of the public purse. So neoliberalism is clearly attracted to the autonomous and inexpensive reserve army of labour that can be created in the name of volunteering. However, such market considerations are usually heavily camouflaged by a rhetoric of in the intrinsic intrinsic personal and social worth of <coughs> volunteering. In Ireland, uh, we can clearly trace the gradual creeping of neoliberalism into political understandings of voluntary activism. Historically, Irish society has had a long-standing uh, tradition of voluntary community work, from the development of mehels um, or self-help activities of local communities in rural Ireland, to the role that religious or orders had in developing voluntary social services um, in Ireland. And some commentators have attributed this practice of volunteerism to the predominance of Catholic social teaching in Ireland until the late 1970s. However, others accredit this practice to necessity, with many voluntary initiatives being established in response to pressing local needs. And I suppose an example there might be the anti heroin campaign that grew up in, uh, in inner city Dublin in the early 1980s. Nonetheless, these examples show how volunteerism in Ireland displayed a grassroots activism which was political in character and motivation. However, since the late 1990s and 2000s, various policy documents and policy units were developed which reconfigured the relationship between the state and the voluntary sector. And this in turn facilitated a reconceptualization of voluntary activity. In 2000, in the white paper on a framework for supporting voluntary activity was launched. Um, one of its primary aims um, was to formalise the relationship between the state and the volunteers or the not-for-profit sector. And in its foreword, then Keisha Fortier Hearn pronounced a new vision for volunteering in what was then an economically prosperous society. So here's Fortier Hearn's insight. Um, voluntary activity formed uh, the very core of a vibrant and inclusive society, particularly in a time of great change in our society, in our country. We must work hard to protect and enhance the spirit of voluntary participation, and we must see this as a key social goal. The great strength of voluntary activity is that it emerges organically from communities. It would be wrong for government to seek control and be involved in every aspect of voluntary activity, but there is no doubt that it can provide an enabling framework to help its activity. Where this involves direct support, a delicate balance must be struck between having a relatively light official involvement and maintaining proper accountability. Little did we know that those words, light official involvement and accountability, would um, have such reverberations uh, since then. Um, so this document basically sets up a discourse around volunteering that both commends it as well as wishes to control it. And the exact nature of this enacting, enabling, I should say, framework that the government would like to extend to volunteering through its relatively light official involvement and accountability will be discussed in more detail shortly. But just suffice it to say that neoliberalism it conceptualizes volunteering to be supplementary to the workings of the state and that individual volunteers, by implication, are loyally compliant to the needs of the state and the economy. Further attempts to individualise volunteering can be found in the recent concept of active citizenship. The Active Citizenship Task Force presents active citizenship as accepting a responsibility for, to help others and being happy to improve the quality of life of those less fortunate than ourselves. 
again a quote from Bertie O'Hearn at the launch of that document. Um, one of the main aims of this task force was to encourage local communities to volunteer and help out. And that's a direct quote from the document. So in this respect, it argues that volunteers are active individuals who show their commitment to their local community by spending time on community projects. Indeed, the amount of time available for volunteering is presented and discussed at length in the document as the only barrier to becoming an active citizen in Ireland. And as Gaynor argued in 2009, by narrowly equating active citizenship with volunteering and helping out in local communities, the notion of both active citizenship and volunteering are depoliticized. So in these, these um, quality documents, we find the concept of volunteering has undergone a process of change. While this shift from a political construction of volunteering to a more individualized one might not at first glance appear significant, for many who see voluntary activity as fulfilling a social and political role, the entrenchment of market philosophies is something to be wary of. By personalizing volunteering, volunteerism is individualized as an essentialist quality present in all of us, which some choose to exercise when we have free time on our hands. And by generalizing volunteering in such a manner, the activist possibility of volunteering is diffused, transforming it into a leisurely pastime. A consumerist model of voluntary activity then emerges where socially unaware individuals participate in volunteering in order to deflect boredom or increase their sense of personal worth. The promotion of the idiomatic benefits of volunteering is done to service neoliberals neoliberalism's aim to disguise the economic gains that neoliberal economies receive from individualizing volunteering. And this then leads to an understanding of volunteering that discourages analysis of dominant economic and political orders. So, um, in terms then, obviously the, the neoliberal construction of volunteerism and volunteering doesn't exist in a vacuum. It needs to be sustained by some sort of social, structural, institutional apparatus. And before we talk about how it, it became, how that neoliberal construction of volunteering in Ireland uh, became a reality in community development in Ireland, I just want to just mention one thing about uh, I suppose something that happened around, um, again, how neoliberal construction of volunteerism is sustained and nurtured uh, by an institution apparatus. Um, it's been observed that a disparity characterizes most neoliberal states in their relationship with the voluntary sector. On the one hand, neoliberalism promotes the abilities and the capabilities of the voluntary se sector, but all the while reducing state funding of governments, social services, and non-profit sector itself, on the other hand. So this Janus head headed strategy creates a structural imbalance in the provision of social services, as well as skewing political and popular expectations around service provision. With the retraction of public financing in for both state and voluntary run uh, services, the voluntary sector in neoliberal states become increasingly drawn into an audit ethos of neoliberalism. So this value for money edict then culminates in the imposition of increased bureaucracy and what has been noted as a trend towards managerialism. Um, so, so what managerialism is, and I'm quoting Ad Hoc and Wills here, it's basically it's a belief in the transferability of management practices across all sectors, all including all sectors. Managerialism denotes that the success or failure of any organization or project lies in its management structure. A strong management structure then is argued, it is argued, will be able to carry out its quest for achieving efficiencies in the organization. And this can take the form of, say, drafted compliance service agreements, creating contracts, three-year work plans, and so on. And with this, a new definition of good practice emerges, um, where, and I'm quoting Morrison here, where a whole new range of monitoring devices, audit requirements, and measurements of outputs from visit, standards, guidelines, and reporting mechanisms, together will transform the ways in which at least some of the voluntary sector think about themselves and exercise choices within a newly constructed framework that reinforces economic forms of reasoning. Um, in Ireland, in the case of applying that to Ireland, the increased visibility of community development work and volunteerism in the policy discourse of the Irish state and the social partnership model of governance since the 1990s has followed a particularly neoliberal uh, trajectory, which has brought about the bureaucratization of community development sector and also the ensuing depoliticization of its work. Um, so first of all, a social, um, policy, sorry, a social partnership model of governance was developed in the 1990s and early 2000s. At a sector level, the community development sector moved from an apolitical space, the most, sorry, devoted 
to the nurturing of local self-help and self-reliance units to becoming one of the pillars of social partnership model. It was contended that the improved access to community and voluntary organisations to government would help increase the impact that they would have on government policy and in turn important change. Um, and one consequence of this development was that the work, that a work of community development became increasingly subject to a programme approach. This meant that community development work became directly funded, coordinated and administered by a number of state, uh, national, I should say, national state funded projects, such as the National Community Development Programme and also the Local Development Social Inclusion Programme. As a consequence, the community and voluntary sector was slowly being co-opted by the state, which in turn helped to reduce the significance of the sector to that of, as what Lloyd calls, mere service delivery. This shift away from an activist focus in community work has had a number of implications for community development. In the first instance, it imposed a bureaucratic system that never existed before in the sector. A whole network of support agencies were developed to monitor and to support the sector. Um, these included the infamous Family Support Agency, um, uh, which was set up in 2003 to bring together all family um, services being introduced by the government and also to promote local support for families through uh, family resource centres. And also, it also coincided with a number of privately operated uh, but contracted companies who were offering um, regionally based uh, support workers for family resource centres. Um, while they were expected to provide developmental supports to establish an emerging community and voluntary group, in reality their primary role was as functionaries to the state, adopting, as Lloyd saw it, a quasi-management role on behalf of the department, approving work plans, sitting on interview panels, etc. Moreover, 28% of the government's overall budget in community development was directed towards the support agencies rather than to frontline practitioners. Second, as an example of community action from above rather than from below, community work in Ireland now began to move towards professionalism, managerialism and accountability. Um, and this took many forms. In one instance, it, or it, it, this included the streamlining and also professionalising of community development practitioners um, in keeping with the 2000 white paper, local community projects all had to register and comply with the company registration office as well as apply for charitable status. Um, and for this reason, all char community, voluntary and charitable organisations then had to adhere to a code of conduct and have articles of associations. In the example which we'll talk further, which is family resource centres, um, the articles of associations for family resource centres and also community development projects um, they required, for instance, that local community members sit as officers of the, of the limited company with overall accountability for the successful running of the project. Um, local volunteers also another feature of this increased bureaucratization of uh, managerialism of the sector. Local volunteers were also increasingly seen as inputs um, of the organi community organisation who needed to be managed controlled and retained in order to ensure the successful and efficient running of the organisation. And this bureaucratic response to volunteers involved the drafting of volunteering policies, um, the development of volunteer programmes for the induction and the training of volunteers and also of the registering volunteers with the Garda Vetting Unit. Um, in these ways we see how the state achieved the relatively light <coughs> official um, involvement it needed to make volunteering accountable, again taking the quotes from the white paper. Uh, as it went about transforming community development into a neoliberal service delivery model. While it initially promised improved access and, and impact of community and voluntary organisations at a national level, the model of social partnership quickly emerged as a pretense. Um, and of the number of, um, of community development workers themselves were quite critical of this uh, move, of these changes. This alliance rested uneasily with some community and voluntary activists. Um, because in their mind, it allowed for, and I'm quoting um, here from Lloyd again, the sector and its agencies to be co-opted and to be compromised. So social uh, partnership then acted as a foil for the Irish government and its embrace of neoliberalism by providing them with, and again, here's Lloyd, very vocal on this point, um, a mechanism to contain discourse and to ensure that outcomes remain within acceptable boundaries. As a result, very little change was enacted from above, doing relatively little to change the pace of the marginalised then, and this is quite a large quote, which I'm not too sure I actually made, uh, made a slide of, which I apologise in the back for, uh, from Lloyd, as he says then, through its control of funding and the use of me mechanisms such as the task force on activist citizenship and the eulogisation of volunteerism, 
The state found preference for a form of communitarianism that was compliant, individualized, and welfare focused, and that spurned collectivized and politicized action. Building social capital and providing services rather than promoting structural change became the mantra, deflecting efforts away from a more institutional analysis of social exclusion and inequality. So, what does that, where does that all lead us? Over the past 20 years, we find that community development work in Ireland has become more directed towards tackling bureaucratic, bureaucratic um, procedures and inefficiencies rather than focusing on social inequality and social exclusion. The depoliticizing of community development work has also coincided with the rationalizing of volunteer capacity, treating volunteers as inputs to the process that can be recruited, selected, vetted, trained, and ultimately controlled. Um, their regulation then occurs but within the project that they find that themselves volunteering through the management skills of the project coordinator or also their in-house volunteering policies as well as outside and beyond their project through statutes and policies that we sort of outlined earlier. It would appear then that volunteering in the community then has become organised as Michael <coughs> Morrison uh, had argued and not spontaneous or reactive. While neoliberalism appears to be successful in subduing the political and activist nature of volunteering in the community, the program-based approach of community development in Ireland has also facilitated the diversification of voluntary labour into ordinary, in inverted commas obviously, project volunteers and voluntary, dir voluntary directors. These are the volunteers who've taken on a distinctive managerial role in their individual projects with full legal responsibility. While the creation of voluntary directors demonstrates the full realization of the discourse of individual responsibility in neoliberalism, applied, but applied to the context of community development projects, the fact remains that very little is known about these volunteers. Who are they? Why do they become voluntary managers, directors, I should say, of these community projects? And how do they respond to this level of personal and legal responsibility? Considering the overall lack of research on volunteering in the Irish community development in, in Irish community development projects, it would be tempting to indulge in the notion, as we talked about earlier, that these volunteers are just do-gooders par excellence. However, um, what I hope to, to put across in this seminar is, uh, I suppose, a belief or desire to dismiss such an idealized and essentialized notion of these people um, because obviously it resonates um, as a neoliberal neo and depoliticized interpretation of volunteering. So, I'm trying to sort of flesh out more about, um, I suppose, who these voluntary directors are, these new categories of volunteers that have created as a result of the bureaucratization and the depoliticization of community development work. Um, basically what um, I'm going to do in the remainder of the project, or the seminar, I should say, is talk a bit more about the, the, the Family Resource Centre pro project. I'm going to first of all outline its role and its function. Um, and then I'm going to introduce to you um, some research, some information that we do have about um, the volunteers who, who um, volunteer on Family Resource Centre projects, and that's through the SPEAK evaluation reports, that, uh, annual reports that come out every year. Um, but obviously, while these findings offer an indication of the scale of um, this organised volunteerism that we're talking about in Family Resource Centres, it doesn't offer us um, an understanding of how the, how the individual um, volunteer responds to the rationalization, the specialization, the bureaucratization of the work that they're doing. Um, so basically what I will be introducing is um, a piece, just very quickly at the end, um, some, some quotes and findings from the qualitative research which I did um, based on the experiences on one family resource center mm -hmm. voluntary directors. Now, before I go any further, this researcher openly acknowledges that this is a really small scale study and that it is not intended, it's not intended that the findings that I, or the, the comments, the experiences that I relate to that they've had about being voluntary directors in family resource centres is anyway generalizable to the whole sector, but I suppose in the light of the fact that we have such gaps, that there's such a lack of knowledge about who, uh, I suppose qualitative knowledge about uh, the voluntary directors in this sector, and the fact that there's those their voices absent from this whole discourse, um, the neoliberal discourse about volunteerism, um, it just might be just noteworthy at most that there's much we could probably uh, as there's much strength we could we could put to um, those quotes that I'm going to talk about as to um, again just offering some sort of insight into their experiences. So the 
Family Resource Centre project. At the start of the seminar, when we talked, a lot of you put up your hands, so, I, so I'm sure so a lot of people here have a practical and personal experience of the Family Resource Centre program. Um, basically, what they are generally, Family Resource Centres are um, community based organisations who take a proactive and innovative approach in identifying the needs in, of families and providing community based supports. And their general aim is to help combat disadvantage in local communities through supporting families. And the type of family support which we offer can be either of a direct nature or indirect uh, in nature. Families can be direct, su supported directly through different services that the resource centre offers. Um, and this might involve a mix of developmental activities such as adult education classes, parenting classes, arts and crafts classes, or it could be access to services such as affordable childcare, after school services at a local level, um, but also some visits by family resource centres and um, basically should try and undertake some outreach work into the community to, to help meet and meet the, the needs of the marginalised there directly. Um, so, and another thing I suppose about this project is that these centres are also expect to encourage local people to participate in the centre and its work from the design to the planning stages of a family resource centre's actual establishment and by acting as volunteers, thereby creating an opportunity for community involvement activism. So through these initiatives, family resource centres are proposed to improve the self-esteem of the people in the local community that they're based and also empower and facilitate groups and individuals <coughs> experiencing uh, exclusion to take control of their own lives and address their needs through um, principles of community development. So family resource centres uh, were first established in 1994 to mark the International Year of Family in response to claims that there was a lack of statutory support for community development activities focusing on support of families and tackling child poverty. Initially, 10 family resource centres were funded on a pilot basis for three years, and upon their evaluation in 1997, the programme was rolled out and funded by the Department, the, 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 the then Department of Family and Community Services. And since then, the programme has grown considerably, and now we're up to 106 in 2011. So as you can see, um, great geographical spread as well there in terms of where they, um, they are located um, around the country. So um, since the program has grown, um, in 2003, Family Support Agency was established by the then <laughs> Department of Social and Family Affairs to help bring together, basically, all the family services and programs introduced by the government. And their job is to, is to help with provision of staff, to offer practical and one-off grant funding to help family resource centres provide local based support to families. As I said, we don't really know an awful lot about this sector. Um, the one source of information that we do have is the SPEAK evaluation tool, which they use. Um, and this report, the SPEAK uh, report, um, S-P-E-K, as it says, is um, it's a report, it's, there's annual reports, it's published every year. Um, so SPEAK is basically, it's a computerized evaluation system that's been specifically designed for the Family Resource Centre. Um, sector, it's a tool for data collection and self-evaluation, and it's been up and running since 2004. Um, and while it's a tool supposedly for self-evaluation, every family resource centre is told to 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 um, fill in this, uh, to comply, to fill this evaluation tool in, um, um, and answer the question provided by an actual department assigned deadline. Um, so a yearly report is generated um, from all these individual submissions. And we've had regular <coughs> reports since 2007, but before that, between 2004 and 2007, they didn't actually launch individual yearly reports. So what we had in 2007 was the issuing of two reports. One was a summary of trends from 2004 to 2007, so there's more of an amount of information, of information there. And then we have then 2007 proper then starting from that. So this is the type of information that we can get from um, from the speak evaluation, as I said, it's it's offered as a self evaluation tool, but really it's the only way in which, uh, and in that way, it's meant to sort of provide um, sort of the space for family resource centres management, their volunteers, and their staff to sort of think about the progress that the project has achieved um, in the previous year's activity. Um, so while it is sort of all, it is a self evaluation tool, um, it's sort of it's not meant to be sort of an ex form external. Ex Evaluation is the only information we have about the sector. So, in terms of just general, I suppose, monies, um, total operating funding for the SSC program between 2004 to 2010, and I know there's been gaps there because, as I said, in, in terms of issues with the projects there, are yearly reports um, regularly until recently. So, we have late figures 36.7 million euros is how much um, the government uh, put into the funding. 
In terms of then obviously the key issue that I want to just draw our attention to is the staffing issues, the whole sort of human resource uh, side of things. In terms of staffing levels, now this includes full and part-time, this doesn't really go into detail in terms of extrapolating out full versus part-time and hope so, these are all just rounded up figures. Um, what we have is a total basically um, just over a thousand are funded by the HSC or the FSA and then there's other funded schemes as well, people are funded the HSC or charities or other organisations. So in total coming up to, a, was it over three year period we've over 5,000 staff full and part time in the sector uh, who have been funded either by the FSA or by, by the HSC. Thank you. Okay, big deep breath. Now, obviously that's the staffing level, but what about the volunteers? And I've already, I've already said, I've hinted at the start that they take up um, their huge part in terms of how they just hope um, roll itself out. Um, and in fact, it's part of even being part of this whole scheme, it's supposed to be very much um, inclusive, inclusive of its you know, community. So what we have here in terms of the numbers then of volunteers and the volunteers directly participated in the Family Growth Centre program from 2007 to 2010. What we have is, as we can see, we can see a significant jump from 2007 to 2008 in terms of ordinary project volunteers. Um, but it have after that, 2008, a very, a very steady enough um, um, increase in numbers. Um, it's not the growth rate in volunteer directors is much more haphazard. There's a lot more variable a variation in that. It goes up and it goes down every year. So we won't know till next year now. Again, going on this trend, we'll see that it fall back down again. But um, so again, we just have just over a thousand, one thousand one hundred and nine people as volunteer directors uh, in the last uh, report. So when you compare, then obviously them side by side, staff both pay full and part time versus the volunteers, both ordinary project workers and volunteer directors. What we're talking about basically is that there is about just under two and a half times as many volunteers as there are staff working in the full sector. Um, and um, obviously with that comes a lot of responsibility as we've already heard about uh, the type of jobs that they might have to do and the, the type of roles and responsibilities which voluntary directors assume is obviously at a totally different level um, than the type of responsibility and roles which are associated with the ordinary project workers. Um, in terms of then I suppose focusing more specifically on the voluntary directors because again this is a new category of volunteer, when it comes to I suppose what do they do? Um, as Speak is, I suppose, part of the bigger neoliberal audit ethos. Um, what does it ask for in terms of when it's looking for evidence of the amount of work that voluntary directors do in the Family Resource Centre Program? It asks them to calculate the hours that they are. And each individual uh, came out involved through a management committee and perhaps played based on their own record how, how many hours they put into the project. And as you can see here, we're seeing a huge jump. Um, even one year between 2007 and 2008 in terms of the, how the hours that they give to their to, you know, overall to the project, to this program. So in 2010, we're up to 44,000 hours given by voluntary directors. And as you saw back there, the 2,000, 2000 people are giving that much of their time and are in to these projects. So again, it shows a number of things around, um, um, I suppose, the um, how much, um, I suppose, the the, the economic rationalisation that comes through um, in, in terms of, I suppose, this project here, where they're obviously the department are saving themselves an awful lot of money if they're relying on over 44,000 hours pre gratis from volunteer directors in terms of leading and managing and taking over all responsibility for these projects. Um, how are we for time? We're out of it time, are we? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, other interesting thing about the information that we have, again, just gathered from Speak, which is again, is just purely, it, it is, I'm going to make it now something quantitative, um, is that we can, there's definitely gendering going on here in terms of who then, it answers in some ways, who participates, who becomes volunteer directors, and we're seeing it again, the majority are, are women. I couldn't find, now maybe it's there, but I just couldn't see the breakdown in the latest report, um, so I don't know, maybe they're there. But again, very much a, a very gendered, um, obviously, with a, lot, with a lot less women on, on um, sorry, a lot less men, I should say, on volunteers, on boards of management than, on, than women. But that reflects the sector in general. And what we find, anyways, is that there's a lot more women employed. And again, uh, team development sector than men. I think the latest result, report that I saw, about, especially in the family resource centre sector, but I think it was only about 
touching the hand then touching the feet touching by the touching the legs and the hands of men are uh, men are actually paid employees for a pay stuff um, either by necessity or non necessity family goes under or family support isn't here now that family support isn't funded um, so that's as much as what speak offers us in terms of um, finding out who we know what they do and how much they give of their time to um, to the uh, family resource centres, um, and we know that the majority of them are women. Um, but th so that's pretty much what we had until relatively recently. In, again, in this 2010, the latest report, um, for the first time ever, Speak actually the report actually went a bit further and gave us a bit more information about um, voluntary directors. Up on the pages there, so just bear with me two seconds. And so, for the first time, what they actually did is they included quotes from um, uh, from volunteer directors. Now, when you're filling up the Speak program, a lot of it is a case of you have to quantify your time, how much time you gave to the project. But there are occasions at the end of particular sections, um, open dialogue boxes which you can fill in accordingly. Um, and here, for the very first time, we actually see the authors of Speak reports actually including their comments. And what's interesting is, again, the type of comments which they make and the, uh, the common thread between uh, underlying all the comments is how hard it is to be a volunteer director and how much work is, is it, how much work is demanded of them and how difficult and challenging it is, both personally but also in terms of just juggling your work-life balance and things like that. So, for example, these, just, these are three quotes that they put in. So the level of responsibility involved in being a member of board of management, i.e. being an employer, becoming a director, is proving off-putting to prospective members. Falling numbers of volunteer directors and increasing pressures on those who remained on the board also proved challenging or understood. A lot of people are happy to volunteer their time as they love being unemployed. However, there is still the issue of finding it difficult to encourage people to volunteer on the board of management um, as a result of the legal obligations and responsibilities. So again, there's, there's a huge sort of mismatch um, in terms of, I suppose, what the sector demands of people who um, take on this position. Um, and I suppose just the day-to-day the -day reality then of being a voluntary director or a family resource centre. Okay, sorry, found my page. Okay, so it's clear from these quotes that the experiences of being a voluntary director is a demanding one. One which clearly requires project management skills. Um, and the essentialist rhetoric of volunteering um, that we find in neoliberalism clearly finds its limit here. Um, having time on one's hands clearly does not. Sorry. here between the rhetoric of volunteerism as generated and sponsored by neoliberalism. It just argues the point that, or promotes the notion that volunteering is harmless, only costs a bit of your time, and again, it's something that, you know, you sh you know it'll make you feel good about yourself. Gleaming over these quotes, um, what we get a sense of here is that it is incredibly hard and challenging work um, for the people who do become voluntary board uh, mem members. Um, I suppose picking up on this sort of sense and this tent, this sense of um, I suppose this this difficulty that people have in terms of maybe coming up, stepping up the next level from just being an ordinary project member, volunteer member to becoming a voluntary director. Um, that's what inspired me to go and do a bit more further digging. I suppose two years ago about um, what it is like to be a voluntary uh, member, of voluntary director of Family Resource Centre. So what I did, and I'm not going to labor the point because I know I'm way, way, way out of time. But I'm just going to direct you to, like all the good uh, researchers do, to the publication that will be out next month, um, where I talk in a lot more detail about the experiences of, and again, I know I preface it by saying, it's just the, a case study of one family resource center, which just so happens to be quite a long-standing resource center, well established in its community. And, um, and the experiences there where I did research, qualitative research on the experiences of the people who did volunteer to become voluntary directors of that um, family resource center and the huge immense challenges that it, it, it um, presented to them personally, emotionally, um, but also just at a level of skills. 
skills and essentially it was a huge learning curve for them to try and uh, get their head around all the statutes and the responsibility of being an employer and, and as one of the value them said like they've never even hired you know never hired someone before or fired someone before but yet this was part now of their job and it was very difficult to do when you lived in that community you're a member of this community and you have to maybe um, intervene on maybe staff issues um, where the people are not working at working out and they could be your neighbors they could be people working in the street and the whole complications that come with that so the book I'm sh is going to be published as far as I'm aware Gil and Macmillan will have the launch sometime next month it's called uh, community development um, in Ireland theory and practice although don't quote me on that that was the last working title I saw and there you'll find more about the experience of this one particular family resource center and their, vo their volunteer management committee and the challenges which they felt faced filling this post um, filling this position and um, I'll take any more questions if you want to send uh, after if you want to or if you want to ask questions I'll take some <coughs> questions from after section so thank you for your patience